चैप्टर नंबर फोर फेथ एंड फोर्टीट्यूड लेट्स बिगेन द आईज ऑफ टू यंग मैन फ्लिक्ड टू एकॉन एज ही रीच द टेम्पल ऑफ लकोसाज लैंडिंग ट्वेंटी सेवन स्टेप्स डिविजिबल बाय थ्री अ गुड नंबर he moved into his place at the left end of their line without a word but the boy nearest him still chuckled low he was almost as tall as acon built like a stack of boulders but his long narrow face had the twitchy likeness of a meerkat after several seconds he nodded acon's way Nice of you to finally join us, Okojo," said Shomari. Akon didn't answer, fixing his gaze on the front doors before them. They were carved from aged Iroko wood, as unforgiving as steel. Any minute now, the city's saw horn would sound and they would open. Then the rites would begin. He let his fingers find a new rhythm at his side. One, two, three, one, two, three. So, this time, Shomari made a point of jabbing an elbow into Akon's ribs hard, messing up his count. Where were you? We're not supposed to be talking, Mensa. Akon said, through his teeth, hoping his use of the body's surname was enough of a hint. Let me guess. Shomari's black eyes grew flinty. You were hope up somewhere. reading the ancient ramblings of some crusty old master to i'll bet the ladies love that your mother loves it akon muttered at the other end of the line fahim adibayo snickered shomari gritted his teeth as though he meant to fight and for a second look as though he might try it but then he seemed to think better of it and started ahead Akon barely resisted a smirk. As the sons of prominent Yaba families, he and Shomari had grown up together, but that didn't mean they liked each other. In recent months, their once somewhat cordial rivalry had changed drastically. The old rivalry was still there; it just lacked the cordiality. A moment of silence passed among the three of them. Before Fahim cleared his throat, he wasn't tall like Akon or burly like Shomari, and his face still held a softness that didn't allow him to ever really look serious. "What do you think he is going to make us do?" he whispered, for the last rise. Shomari shrugged too quickly. "Do no, don't care. It was a lie." But Akon didn't bother to call the bluff. Deep down, he knew they all had good reasons to be afraid. Mere weeks ago, they would stand on these very steps, crowded among fourteen other Jaba boys who, like them, had spent their whole lives dreaming of becoming sons of the six. Now they were the only ones left. The reality of it shouldn't been exciting, if not slightly intimidating, but Akon struggled to focus on it. He was standing before the city's most revered site, but his mind was still down in its bowels. Remembering what he would heard, the strange things the old woman had said. Does it call to you often? It calls to me sometimes. It couldn't tell you why. Magic is a peculiar thing, as are the things it touches. He didn't know which part of the encounter he found more unsettling in recollection. on the one hand it was frightening that he would hear baba's voice so far away from the jungle but worse still the old woman had known it she would emphasized with him and even said she sometimes heard things coming from the jungle too how had she known he would never told anyone about what he had heard what he got near the trees the disturbing things hoarded in his memory even thinking about them now made his hands clammy 
His fingers were twitching, eager to restart their tapping when a low tremor interrupted his thoughts. His ears rang with the metallic bellow of the saw horn up in one of the temple's towers. Rattling his bones from head to toe, there was a pause and then as if on the cue, the scrape of weatherhead wood against stone. The temple's front doors opened and all three of them immediately straightened as a figure emerged from its shadows. A corpulent man dressed in a sweeping blue robe met their gaze. Icon tensed. There was no explicit way to know that Father Olufemi was old. His umber skin was unwrinkled and his thin black hair was betrayed by only a few strands of grey near the temple. But sometimes about the holy man always exuded and ageless as the Kohani, he alone led the temple's brothers of the order, and in more ways than one. He was the city's leader. Ikon felt he the shrewd evaluation in the man's hawkish eyes as he looked over each of them. Come with me, he murmured. Ikon's heart pounded like a goat-skin drum as they followed him into the temple. Dozens of white prayer candles illuminated the stonework of its worship hall. 192 at a quick count, arranged on metal in built-in shelves that reached all the way up to its vaulted ceilings. Wafts of burning cedar wood suffused the air with every step as Father Olufmi led them deeper inside. And Akon knew the scent came from the offering fires of the brother of the temple kept stoked at all times. It was the smell of home, the temple of Lakosa housed worship halls, a library studies, even a dormitory where candidates and unmarried sons of the six slept when off duty. It was magnificent, reverent, and like no other place in all the city. He noted He noted the multicolored banners folded in woven baskets to be shared with the rest of the populace in two months. The temple was already preparing for the bonding, a celebration of the gods to be initiated into the sons of the six just before such a holiday would be a special honor. Line up. Father Olufmi still had his back to them. But his voice cracked through the quiet like a wave. I can scramble to move back to his assigned place. Standing shoulder to shoulder with his co-candidates, he bowled his face to keep his fingers from moving. Father Olufemi faced them again, eyes appraising. Candidate Adibayo, Candidate Mansa, Candidate Okojo. He nodded to each of them in turn. The three of you are the last remaining candidates eligible for warriorship his season. You stand on the cusp of joining a hallowed brotherhood, a covenant eternal and divine. There are men who would lay down their very lives for membership and many who already have. I can swallow it. He thought about Memorial Hall, a quiet corridor in the temple that bore a permanent list of fallen sons etched directly into the stone walls. He knew about men laying down their lives for this brotherhood. His own father's name was on that list. You have completed five rites on the sacred passage to warriorship. Now the time has come for you to undergo last. Father Alufmi continued, If you are successful, you will be anointed as son of of the six tonight. If you're not, your journey will come to an end. But holy law, you will not be permitted another chance to take the rights and you will never speak of them again. Akan knew he should have been paying closer attention as Father Lufmi went on, but it was next to impossible now. Both excitement and anxiety warmed his skin, pumping blood hard and fast through his veins and making it harder and harder to keep still. This is it, he thought. It's finally happening. When none of them raised objections, Father Olufmi gave an austere nod. Very well then, let us begin. He gestured for them once again to follow him out of the worship hall and down one of its connecting halls. Akkad kept his strides even as they ventured deeper into blackness, turning and twisting through corridors until he was sure they were lost. He would spend the last ten years of his life here in the temple, but he doubted he would ever know the full extent of its layout. In time, they reached a weatherhood door illuminated by single scones mounted to the wall. Father Olufmi opened the door and ushered them into a small windowless room. 
account stilled as he saw what was in its center. The woman raffia basket on the floor was large and round, not unlike the ones he sometimes saw women balance atop their heads down in the market, but something about this basket was wrong. It was moving. Without a word, Father Lufmi ambled over to it, leaving them at the door. If he was at all concerned about its contents, he made no outward sign of it as he faced them again. Recite chapter 3, verse 13, from the book of 6. Akon's mind was frighteningly blank for a few seconds before he memorized. Words trembled from his mouth. A righteous man honors the six as he honors each breath. He said in tandem with Fahim and Shomari. He honors them constantly with the words of his tongue, the thoughts of his mind, and the acts of his body, for all as long as he should live among God's fearing men. Father Alufmi nodded, A holy warrior, true son of the six, must be obedient at all times. He must answer only to the six gods and goddesses of our faith, and to those through whom they speak. Do you understand that, candidates? Yes, Father, they replied in unison. And you understand, Father Lufmi glanced at Akon, that when ordered to act in the name of the six, you must always obey without question or hesitation. Akon had the distinct feeling that he was teetering on the edge of something, preparing to leap into some unknown abyss. He glanced at the strange moving basket again before answering, Yes, Father. Then you are ready without warning. Father Lufmi stood and stopped to lift the basket lid. There was a faint sound of stirring. He gestured for three of them to approach with every step closer. Akon sensed it, a wrongness that implored him to bear turn back, but he forced his feet to move forward until he was within a foot of Father Alufmi when he saw what was inside the basket. However, his blood ran cold. A tangle of golden brown snakes writhed among one another, twisting and coiling in an indiscussable mass. They didn't hiss nor did they seem to notice that they had new spectators, but a chill erupted across Akon's arms anyway. It was impossible to tell where one serpent's body began and another ended. His fingers tapped, trying to find a cadence. Too many. Can't count. Can't count. Can't count. Fresh anxiety rose in his throat and he found he couldn't swallow it. He didn't know much about snake species, but he was almost certain he knew what these were. Atop their interlaced bodies, three small scraps of parchment rose and fell. With their movements, there was something written on each one, but he was too far away to read them. Three scraps, a good number at least. Shomari moved first, reaching for the slingshot hook to his belt loop, but with surprising speed, Father Alufmi blocked his hand. No. Shomari's eyes widened with surprise, but Father Alufmi spoke before he could. These are Eastern Black Mambas, he explained. There are six of them, one to represent each of our gods and goddesses. They have been anointed by this temple and shall not be harmed. A contest. He didn't like where... This was going at all. Father Lufmi had said there were six snakes, but he couldn't separate them in his mind, which meant he couldn't count them. That frightened him to his core. Every instinct in his body told him to run or, at the very least, to distance himself from them, but he found he couldn't move. A son of the six is a man of faith and fortitude. Father Lufmi went on tonight. We will put both to the test. Each of your family names has been written on a piece of parchment and placed inside this basket. He pointed, your final rite of passage requires you to retrieve your name without being bitten by one of the snakes. We will proceed alphabetically by a surname. New beads of sweat slicked Alcon's neck, and it wasn't from the small room's stifling heat. Frantically, he racked his mind, thinking of what he knew about black mambas. They were said to be the one of the most venomous snakes on the continent. A single bite could kill in a matter of minutes. From this and his brief readings, he knew they weren't particularly aggressive by nature but provoked. He looked to his co-candidates, Fahim's, 
nostrils flared as he took hard breaths in and out through his noise. Shomari pupils were dilated, both were visibly shaking as if one q one of the serpents lifted his head slightly from the basket to eye them with curiosity. It opened its blue black mouth and in the low light venom glistened wet on its fangs Econ froze. Candidate Adibayo said Father Luf me proceed. I can watch Fahim shuffle towards the basket, trembling from head to toe. He started to bend at the middle, then as though thinking better of it, lowered to his knees. The serpents turned toward him, six pairs of glittering black eyes watching and waiting for him, started to reach out but withdrew his hand when one of the snake hissed. Father Alufmi shook his head. They are anointed, which means they will only bite those who are unworthy, he murmured. You must act without fear and you must act with faith. Fahim nodded, chest rising and falling as he steadied himself. He shifted his waist, flexed his fingers so and so fast, Akon barely saw it. Snatched a scrap of parchment from the center of the basket, he stumbled backward, landing on his bottom, and then he held the paper up to his eyes to read the name scrawled on it. Every muscle in his body instantly relaxed, and he handed the paper to Father Olofmi, who nodded. Very good. Candidate Mana Mensa. It is your turn. Shumari. Shumari was more confident than Fahim, but not by much. He circled the basket like it was prey, very eyes fixed on the two remaining slips of the paper as he tried to determine which bore of his family name. But when it came to kneel before the basket, he shook his head badly. Unlike Fahim, he reached into it with painstaking care, sweat gathering on his upper lip as his fingers hovered over the snake's knotted bodies. He pinched one of the scraps, then carefully withdrew his hand. Nervous laughter echoed around the room as he rose, and Father Lufmi took his slip from him. After reading it, he nodded again, in indicating for him to move back and stand beside Fahim. Akon winced when the holy man's eyes shot to him. Candidate Gojo, come forth. Akon tried to swallow again but found his throat had gone dry. He counted his stealth for a bad number. His legs seemed to move of their own accord as... Father Lufmi gestured toward the basket a final time, then stepped back to give him space. At last, Econ made himself look down at it. There, right in the basket center, he could see the last scrap of parchment. The name written on it was penned in bold black ink, Okojo. That was it. The piece of paper was the final thing standing between him and everything he would work for. Uh, he lowered slowly, ignoring the stone, pressing hard against his knees at once, as though somehow aware that he was their last intruder. The Mambas hissed loudly in his unison, their cold eyes meeting his own likely onyx plucked from a starless night sky. He remembered Father Olifam words spoken only moments before, they will only bite those who are unworthy. He swallowed what if he was unworthy, he thought of the jungle, he, the things he had done, the things he had not done. He thought of the strange old woman, the secrets he held on to, and a monster. It always seemed to lead black to the monster. He thought of the voice that plagued his nightmares. Please, in his mind, Baba's voice was still slurred, pained. Please, my son. No, Akon screwed his eyes shut. He made himself think of Kamau, of the temple, and of the life of the two of them had made here. After Baba's death, he replaced visions of greater jungle with memories of scorching hot training sessions on the temple's front lawns and smell of rice bread baking in the kitchen, a library full of books, and that he could count forever and ever. Be strong. He heard Kamau's voice in his mind, reassuring and confident as always, you can do this. And remember, Kotoka Mizizi. Kotoka Mizizi, the word made six syllables, six a good number. Slowly, he opened his eyes again with his Free hand, Akon drummed his fingers against his side, finding an O rhythm as he chanted his ancestors' words in time with it. One, two, three. Kutoka Mizizi. After tonight, everything would change. After this, we would finally belong to something of brotherhood. Kutoka Mizizi, in his people's eye, in the city's eye, he would be respected as a warrior and a man. Children would look up to him. Girls would notice him. He would at least make Baba proud, even if... His father wasn't here to see it. 
He might make his mother proud even if she had not stayed to see it either. He steadied himself as he reached for the slip, fingers extending towards the snake. He would do it Shomari's way slow and carefully. He counted the distance as it grew smaller. Nine inches, six inches. The door flung open with a bang. So sudden, Ekon was on his feet with his hanjari drawn before he would even discern who had opened it. When he saw who it was, however, he lowered the blade, confused. The young man staring back at them held a torch and wore a sky blue kaftan, dampened with sweat around his neckline. He was tall, broad, and brown skinned, chest having as he fought for breath. He was a son of the six. Kohani. The warrior pounded his fist against his chest in salute and bowed at his middle. Warrior Selazi. What is the meaning of this? Akon had never seen Father Olufemi so angry. The holy man's mouth was set in a tight line and a large vein near his temple throbbed dangerously. How dare you interrupt a sacred rite? Forgive me, Father Fahim and Shomari exchange a look at the warrior board again. Lure for good measure. For the first time, Akon noticed that he was trembling and that when he spoke, there was a catch in his voice. Captain E. Okojo commanded me to find you at once. Akon's heart skipped a beat. Kamau had sent this warrior. The realization put him on edge. Something wasn't right. Father Lufmi, expression sharpened. What has happened? Speak. Warrior Selassie straightened from this second bow and met Father Alufmi gaze. It's Baz, Matombe's night zoo. He whispered, it's burning. <laughs>